We heard from an elderly Canadian who is in Tobago. He was booked on a flight over the weekend. That flight was cancelled, then rebooked today. But that government isn't allowing planes in or out of that country. And as you say, there are likely thousands of people in similar circumstances. What do you say to those people? Uh, the best thing that they, they should do is to register with the government of Canada. We have a registry for Canadians abroad. Uh, that's the best way for us to bring them the most, uh, the, the, the most updated information. As you said, Matt, it depends from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, sometimes even regions between countries. Uh, that would be the best advice is that register, make sure you have the emergency number that we have uh, been giving to Canadians to make sure that they can actually contact us in case uh, of emergency. In, the, that, in those jurisdictions where the planes aren't coming in or coming out, how long should Canadians expect to be there? And is there anything, if they're stuck there for, for weeks or for months, is there anything that the Canadian government can do beyond having them register? Well, in, in certain cases, I mean, let, let me give you a good example. Peru is a good example where yesterday uh, I negotiated until very late in the evening, despite that the country is closed, despite that the airspace now is, is uh, managed by the military, we were able to negotiate uh, and, and that's news to, to have uh, three flights uh, going to Peru. We know that there's a number of school children, elderly, uh, tourists which are stranded there. So we have been able to negotiate. So it's really on a case by case. And um, despite the fact that airspace are closed and airports and, and sometimes even martial law, uh, my job is to negotiate on a case by case basis where we have a cluster uh, of Canadians and where Canadians can gather in one place so that we can. Uh, facilitate their return. Uh, we have worked with WestJet, with Air Canada, Sunwing, um, Air Transat to uh, facilitate that. People will pay a commercial fare. But what we're doing um, is, is kind of removing all these barriers. But I must admit to you, Matt, it is a real challenge. This is on a scale that no one has ever seen. I had a call with uh, some G20 colleagues uh, earlier this week. Mm. And what we're saying, whether it's the UK, whether it's France, the Germany, uh, the scale and the complexity that we're facing has never been seen before. This is a book yet to be written because no one has ever seen anything like that where you have all these things at the same time and you're trying to bring back people back uh, to, to, to Canada. Just finally on this, um, people can't get through. As you mentioned, you know, the calls are coming in, emails are being sent, but people aren't hearing back. Um, the demand is overwhelming. What steps are you taking to deal with that part of the equation? Well, we've basically transformed the whole Global Affairs Canada into a consular uh, office. Uh, everyone now is seized of that. Our embassies, uh, some have had to go on emergency measures, but we're making sure that um, whatever services we can provide locally, that we're doing it through our emergency response center. And the other thing, I think there's never been a better time to coordinate, consult, cooperate. Um, I spent a good part of my days talking to other nations, uh, build alliances, partnership to make sure that... Uh, if we cannot go to a particular jurisdiction, a particular location, that we work with uh, colleagues and allies uh, to, to give safe passage to Canadians so that they can transit to one of the open aerial bridge that we will have. So it's really, a, it's almost like a chess game. Every time that something is closed, mm -hmm. we need to find a way uh, to, to bring our people. And um, that's what we're doing on a 24-hour, uh, seven-day basis.